special welcome to today's uh, podcast. I am super, super excited to be in conversation with uh, Dr. Jack Ludic, all the way from uh, Cape Town. Doc, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. <laughs> I am super excited because you are a thought leader on uh, democratizing artificial intelligence. Yes. And I am just super, super excited to get into that conversation. But before we get into our conversation, I just want our listeners to know a little bit about uh, who you are and uh, the career journey that you've walked. I know you are a dad, you are a husband, and uh, you value family. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Sarah, thank you very much. Yes, um, I've been, I've been uh, fortunate. I grew up here. I was born under Table Mountain here in Cape Town. So um, beautiful place here. I live here in Somerset West, and I can still see Table Mountain, and I can see the beautiful False Bay here, and the vineyards and the mountains. So it's beautiful. I used to live up there in Pretoria as well, as I've mentioned, for ten years. But most of my life, I've been here. Um, I, I always had an interest in science and math and computers. And when I grew up, it was kind of the computer era. And mm -hmm. I also studied, I did my, uh, my honors, masters and PhD in computer science and specifically in artificial intelligence. And at that time, it was like the winter period. We didn't know it's going to be as, as impactful and huge as it is right now. Uh, but I was always intrigued by kind of, and the brain as well, just understanding the brain. And even some of the research I did at University of Stellenbosch, where I was, uh, I was first a, a lecturer, a researcher um, at Stellenbosch University before I started my first AI company and went into the, the business world. But uh, one of my first books was on uh, training dynamics, complexity of recurrent neural networks. And then after that, neural networks and psychopathology. So I actually collaborated with psychiatrists that's actually studying the brain. And um, so I'm fascinated about that. Um, so just the human mind, consciousness, the mind, how it works, and, and to actually implement uh, systems that are smart and intelligent. So I was kind of intrigued by machine learning, deep learning, all these kind of things. And then I always also wanted to apply the, this, this kind of incredible toolbox of smart tech. And that's why I went into business. And our first customers was Richmond Minerals and Sassol. And then we did Sunlum and Suntum, all these customers. And my first company was called Ceasing Systems. Um, and it's, uh, I was there for 14 years. So I was fairly young, out of university, after my PhD in AI. Um, I co-founded this with another colleague of me, also I use a PhD chemical engineer. And anyway, so we, we, we built this company. It went global. Uh, providing solutions around the globe in minerals, metals, manufacturing. Uh, we also had Mark Shuttleworth. I don't know if you know about him, but uh, yes, I yeah, do. the first African in space and stuff. He's he's a uh, VC company, Yerby Dragons, were invested in season systems. I think it was around 2002, 2003. And, but we kept it fairly private. And then eventually um, sold that to General Electric. That was the first AI company on the African continent being sold to a multinational. And that was just before the new era of AI, where deep learning and things were starting to explode in terms of AI, the 2010s. So we sold in 2011. But I did spend some time at General Electric. They were trying to build the industrial internet. I was there up to 2015. Um, and as part of the shareholder transaction deal, I had to do that. But I then I had choices. I was I had opportunities in Silicon Valley uh, because we went global. I was we were providing solutions in all the all the continents except Antarctica, but all the continents <laughs> on the globe. And and yeah. uh, but I think one of the wonderful experiences, the things that it's given me, and I know you've done an MBA as well, but in um, and I also work with the business school. I rem remember when I was at university and we were partnering and doing some research. Um, and I was kind of partnering with electronic engineering and all these kind of things. But there's no substitute, as you know, as a businesswoman, uh, to be in the real world, providing solutions, 
um, to customers and addressing their needs and understanding the business value drivers and the KPIs. And that is the kind of things that I've learned firsthand 14 years in C at CSense, but then also General Electric. And so that was a fantastic experience. I think the most valuable thing was not just the money we made with selling the company and all of those kind of things, and obviously being successful in terms of that. It was the experience gained in terms of hmm. providing AI-driven solutions um, globally. And, and that came in good stead as well for my next move. So I've, I thought, okay, we want to make a difference here on the African continent. I can, I can go to Silicon Valley, start my next company there. It could be a smart move from a global perspective. But there's, my, my kids were also still small and my wife didn't want to move. We've got family here and family is important. You mentioned family and stuff. Mm. So, and I'm, I obviously love Africa, love South Africa. I want to make a difference here. We don't want to see Africa left behind. So I felt mm. it's, it's a good thing to say, let's build, let's apply the lessons learned, and try build next gen uh, AI company, and also thinking about building an AI community in Africa. Uh, that's why it was one of the reasons I founded the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa way back 2016. And then I started, uh, there was nothing happening on the African continent. There was no AI conferences, there was nothing yet although the field was really starting to bloom and expanding. And there was a lot of people reaching out. And I was participating in the first AI conferences here. And Data Science Nigeria just started. And they uh, reached out to me as well. And, and from a MIA side, we started assisting them. I spent some time in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and what Data Science Nigeria has built, they've got a massive vision of building a million, they want that million data scientists or at least people that's literate in AI and data science over a 10 year period. They want to have a million people doing that and they are still on that mission. I'm, I'm currently on the advisory board of Data Science Nigeria. So I've been, uh, but that was under the leadership of Bayo Andan Kandi and I was kind of mm -hmm. supporting and I've always kind of been supporting of them. And then there was also Kenya, Ghana, there was lots of um, activities like that happening. And then another guy, John Kamara, reached out and he was part of MIA and he's still on the direct, director there. And he was part of the Cortex AI group, which is the next gen AI company that I founded, um, or Cortex Logic. It was actually Cortex Logic and then we grew, this grew into a group. And there's a, a nice story around that as well. But, um, but John Kamara, just before COVID, he was collaborating and so forth, but he actually... Um, applied, some of the, the seeds were sown, and he was applying similar kind of things in Kenya. Um, and mm -hmm. he started ACE, and I'm also on the board of advisors there, um, and also Adanian Labs, and they're trying to also build the AI ecosystem there. And I was just now recently, I was just coming back from the AI Leader Summit there, and also engaging with the Kenyan government, and sessions on trustworthy AI, and future AI policies, and talking to business leaders as well um, there. Mm. So and they are, and I'm so blown away by the talent and the energy. So, so for me, it's just great. So all of that is part of building the, the AI community. And we know that the tech giants like Google, they they've, they had some great initiatives here in Africa, which is still ongoing, like the deep uh, deep deep learning in Daba. And, mm. and Cortex Logic, uh, my current company and Cortex AI Group supported deep learning in Davos as well, and many events, uh, especially up to COVID. And we are reigniting that now. I've just uh, started a new, um, uh, wrote a new article on igniting the AI Africa ecosystem, where there's a lot of initiatives going on here. And we've got some successes on the, on the mm. commercial front as well. So I'm trying to bring it all together. And I've got um, also a little bit of success in terms of the what we did with Cortex because I think in terms of what you want to build is is business that can actually provide business customer business a customer value and societal value at scale, and you can do this mm. by AI driven platforms. So we've got two spun out companies that will be now listed on the Cape Town Stock Exchange from Cortex. The one is called um, Vive Teen Wellness. So it, it focuses on a driven platform, very human centric. We bring counselors automatically on the platform, but it's got its own AI assistant. 
and it's got world-class content. And we've partnered with NASPAPS also as a media partner, uh, Media24. Um, and we won the World Economic Forum Youth, Youth Mental Health Award uh, last Ooh, year. Wow. Youth Team World. Well, yeah, so, and it's a perfect example of human centric plus AI plus bringing human counselors in and providing mm. a wellness companion in your pocket for teenagers that is really suffering and providing a vehicle to help them as well. And we've got also Journey Wellness, which not only looks at mental health, but diet, nutrition, all sorts of things around that. So it's more holistic. And we work, we're working with actually Botswana as well. Um, there's there's uh, proposals going out to the Botswana government and the Botswana medical scheme funds and so forth around mm -hmm. uh, a journey wellness offering uh, for them as well. So they, they, and you will see a little bit more on that uh, as we go forward now. So those are two AI-driven platform plays focused on healthcare and wellness. Um, they will be listed on the Capital Stock Exchange as part of Arbitrage, which is uh, another entity. So this is still ongoing. Um, in terms of my current moves as well, I, I'm currently putting a sustainable technology venture, venture capital fund together, which will be a fund of funds to invest in sustainable technology. Um, mm. And I'm also thinking about um, resetting Cortex into a, a global player uh, that works tightly with this sustainable technology venture capital fund as well. It's like a, a partner on a global scale. So, so there are those kind of things that's that's part of the, the current thinking here. Quite excited, uh, but uh, that's, that's where I am right now. And I obviously wrote the book, Democratizing AI to Benefit Everyone. That captures yes. a little bit of my story, but what's very exciting about that, and I'm sure we're going to dig into that now, when we talk about humanity and how can we shape a better future in the smart technology era, and that's part of my mm. massive transformation purpose and also the businesses and organizations that I'm involved in. Um, so I'm trying to, to, to make the little ripples effect in civilization just from my humble position. I'm just trying to, to make a difference and collaborating with a lot of talented people from across the world in terms of doing that. I'm also a global AI ambassador for Swiss Cognitive, a world leading AI network. Um, and I'm also on the board of advisors of a number of companies. One is in Dubai, which is looking at a metaverse um, mm. and uh, virtual augmented reality, uh, which is going to be huge for education, I think, healthcare, uh, and a bunch of other things as well. So that, 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 that in a nutshell, but we can dig into the details. Wow, 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 wow. Very, very inspirational. I just love the way you have uh, totally immersed yourself into this work of uh, the AI, but uh, also the fact that you're making impact on the African continent. I mean, before we started recording, we we're talking about uh, how we've got to be doing everything within um our human powers to make sure yep. africa does not remain behind and yes. uh, really you are a shining example of that you're leading uh, the way in terms of uh, just immersing and investing uh, yourself um into bringing solutions um that uh, also speak to the african uh, um context uh, uh, i find yep. that very very exciting uh, great. No, it's good. And I find it exciting that we've got someone like you as well, that you've got uh, big plans and you're also in this kind of space, uh, robotic process automation and IT and stuff. And you're trying to expand in Africa and we need a lot of Sarahs here. So this is good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So then let's get into our second conversation. Yes. Um, let's look at uh, the future of AI. How yes. do you envision the future of AI in terms of the role that um, it plays in our daily lives and how we can ensure that uh, it remains focused on um, human-centric solutions? Oh, Sarah, that's such a great question. I, I, uh, for me, and that's what the way I've positioned it in the book as well, for me, smart tech should be just technology to support us in optimizing mm. quality of life. I know uh, in terms of governments and on a national and also global level, countries are trying to optimize GDP, which is good because if you can up, 
uh, do that, you can hopefully increase the standard of living of many people. But the problem is, we, we actually, what's also happening is uh, the middle class are being hollowed out. Um, the rich is getting richer, the poor is getting poorer, uh, relatively speaking. I think everybody is being uplifted to a certain extent. If you think about even the kings of 200, 300 years ago, they didn't have access to all the information that we've got. And we've got more luxuries and there's more things that's easily available. Uh, um, we can buy foods and shops and we can do so many things. Um, so, but still, I would like to see a more equitable world and we optimize quality of life for as many people as possible. So if AI and software and smart tech can support that, and then that will be great. But that means that we need to re-engineer our economy, maybe fix capitalism, but clearly capitalism is, is, pro is probably the best way to, to incentivize people as well. So it's, it's very good. But you want to reward people for their positive contributions to society. So even if we think about the future of, of jobs and all of those kind of things, if we can re-engineer people's participation in civilization and society where they are rewarded for positive contributions and can even make money in that way, um, that would be awesome. So in my book, I actually talk about uh, specific solutions around that, I, I, but, but it needs to be driven by a why. So, and I think as humanity, if we understand what it means to be human, I think we, we're still on a maturity level, we, we're still struggling to figure out things, um, which is understandable. <laughs> we, we, we're part of this evolutionary process and this is where we are. Um, but if we can grow in wisdom quicker, um, that would be awesome. But I think if we've got a massive transformative purpose for humanity, that's what I've tried to define. Something that actually complements the United Nations SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think is awesome, it's great, but it needs to be not only focused on GDP, it needs to be focused on optimizing quality of life, where we value things like family, uh, uh, character, wisdom, uh, those kind of things, or positive contribution to society. So if we can spread, we create an abundant world where we, we spread the, the abundance to more people and help people to be, to focus on the things that's really important. Because when you, we, we all live for a short time here. And if we can mm. optimize the quality of life for as many people as possible, then more people get meaning from the life that they live. And and, and it would be better. So I just think that's a better world. And, and for me, if technology can support that, um, then that's all good. And that's why I'm excited about AI, because clearly AI can help us solve health problems. It can help if we apply it smart in a wise way. It can help us in education. Currently, the educational model, and people talk about, oh, it's the colonial period, all of it, or we, we, we still sit with all these kind of things. But... With AI and tech, if we provide all our children, give them access to the internet to get to wholesome content, but then also make sure that we personalize education. So we, we get rid of the factory model with people sit in classes. Mm -hmm. um, this is what AI can do now. And we've got even Khan Academy that's got this GPT-4 plugged into the, as a smart tutor to actually help students as well. So, 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 and I think, I think education is, is going to be disrupted, which is good. Um, so those are incredible opportunities to, um, to, 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 to personalize education, to personalize wellness, to personalize healthcare. And if you solve that, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, those are some of the base level things that if we solve that, then you can get to the other things on top of that, where, where, where you can look at, uh, if people's basic needs are addressed, then we can look at things that where they can look at um, uh, making a difference, being creative, living more empowered lives, making a difference in other people's lives because their basic needs are being fulfilled, and live it, and do things in the creator economy. That's why I'm also excited about Web 3.0. If we are getting it right to build a decentralized world that's where the people are empowered where other companies are not just making money with your data and stuff, but it's not just attention-driven, but intention-driven kind of economies. And we need to move to there. Where, and also where people can create. 
a lot of more people, it's almost like we've got a lot of more SMEs, a lot, a lot more businesses where people offer their services in a decentralized world. Um, I think it's going to be a better world. So if AI can help with that, um, I think that would be awesome. And I, there's a lot more to unpack there, but I want to just maybe leave it there for now. No, actually, I want us to dig deeper, don't okay, because let's go you've deeper. actually dropped, <laughs> you've dropped uh, interesting and exciting concepts there. So yes. I love uh, the viewpoint that you're talking uh, about uh, how AI is going to disrupt education. I want us to unpack that. And I yes. also want us to unpack how Web 3.0 economy yes. uh, will impact businesses and what, what it is. What does it look like? What will it look like? I just saw yeah. that people can have uh, a clear understanding because people hear all these big words and um, they don't understand what it is. So, yes. So just give us the definition. Maybe let's start with uh, the Web 3.0 and then we come to the education uh, conversation uh, and AI. Uh, so yes. please uh, just indulge us. What is I, I Web uh, 3.0? And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, this is so interesting. I, I was just on a podcast uh, on where we talked about AI and Web3, the perfect yes. match, question mark. Uh -huh. And uh, and I actually have links. I'm, I'm actually putting this, I'm writing an article right now on AI and Web3. It's a very topical. Uh, that will be in a magazine. And I'm going to finish it today, but where I actually talk about uh, this uh, in more detail. And I actually have some nice mm -hmm. definitions. So Web3 is like the new vision for the internet that aims to create a more decentralized, secure, and you, a kind of user-centric kind of digital ecosystem. Um, and, and I think what's also great about where we are right now, it's just not, not only AI that's evolved and is rapid advances, but even blockchain to kind of technology, mm -hmm. I think it's got an important role to play in terms of decentralization. We know we've got cryptocurrencies and NFTs and those kind of things, but those are just applications of blockchain. But the, the kind of technology that enables decentralization, I think it's going to be very important. And if you think about decentralized protocols as well, uh, where you create trustless, transparent, censorship resistant applications and services, I think that's going to be really, really good. And, and there's also, uh, I think if you look about the convergence of Web3 and AI, I've got some interesting kind of statements around that. So I think, the convergence indeed paving the way for a new era of decentralized innovation. We are going to see transforming industries, not only with AI. AI is going to disrupt industries on its own. But the convergence of Web3, where we talk about the next gen or the decentralized web with AI, is going to exacerbate or it's going to, it's going to accelerate uh, the transformation of industries. But I also think, and this is for me great, and this is what I talk about in the book as well, it's going to help empower individuals um, as well. So, so, and, and I think the other part is, so we can create a decentralized world where intelligence meets trust. So intelligence could be provided by AI as well, and obviously humans and all of that. And then trust is where we create a decentralized world where we don't need to just trust governments or so forth. We've got the protocols and smart contracts that makes sure that there's no corruption, that that people are doing what they are will be doing, and that they're rewarded for that. So you, if you've got technology that can support that, I think we're putting ourselves on the right guardrails for a better society in future. And even if you think about deep fakes, and we we'll probably get to those kind of things as well, if you've got ways of authenticating people in a natural way based on the technology, technology helps protect to make sure that this is Sarah talking, this is Job talking, we're having this conversation, it's not just other people, then that you can have technology that supports that. So that's why I'm, I'm very excited about that. So I think that security comes in and it could actually help democratization as well in general and, and help to make better democracies. And it's going to be interesting because if you look at um, China, where they're more into collectiveness, which I also think is important. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have a balance between the individual versus the collective. Because as if you look at our bodies as well, we we mm -hmm. we've got trillions of cells. Some of the cells is not even our own cells; it's cells of uh, the micro, the bio microbiome, and 
other bacteria, but we're all working together. But it's important. Um, there's the individual context of a cell, but then there's also how they collaborate and work together. And I think the types of dangers that we face as humanity is more global, it's across borders. And it's going to be interesting if we're still going to have countries as we have today in, say, 200 years or 500 years from now. It might be more globally connected kind of world, more decentralized, communities connecting like nodes in the, of the internet connecting to one another. Could be smart cities, smart towns, smart communities, smart families connected to any other family, which is physical. It could be virtual as well in the metaverse and all sorts of stuff. So it could be, I think it's going to be probably more fluid uh, kind of world, um, where I, I, which which I would really hoping for. So so um, so it's going to be very very exciting how things. Uh, that's what I mean. It could be disruptive also for civilization society. But if we are smart and if we are wise, um, we can create that better world where really people are empowered, but where we still work together as a collective. And I think we need to find that balance. Um, that's where there's a lot to learn from all the different countries with their different cultures mm. and different perspectives and stuff. So you can't just shoot down China or you shoot down uh, the West or whatever. Or I think there's... There is wisdom everywhere, and we just need to be smart to pick the right things and then deploy it. And we also need to think about climate change. What are we doing to planet? Biodiversity. That's why when I talked about sustainable technology venture capital company as well, I think it's important to invest in sustainable technology. Um, mm -hmm. Where we think about, and we're doing that, there's a lot of people, I believe, talk about green energy, hydrogen, all those kind of things, electric cars. But even in the, there, you need to think about pollution. You need to think, what do we do with the batteries? What do we do with... Um, uh, uh, how, do, how do we create a world that's not damaging the biodiversity, not causing more pollution? Um, and so, so we need to think holistically. We need to think on a global level. And then we can think even on a solar level. We can think about, um, do we want to... Obviously, we want to be careful about what we do in space as well. We don't want just too much garbage in space as well. We want to explore. We want to make sure that we do everything sustainable. Um, but first, the planet. I think we're messing up a little bit on the planet. So mm. that's why I've got this massive transformative purpose for humanity. Where And I know it complements United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But there are specific things also about a livable habitat. And also, as, you, as, as humanity, we're still kind of social animals and very dependent. But I'm, I'm also concerned about other life forms because we, we, we would reach a stage where we maybe can produce food in a way that's, that's also better for the planet and maybe not uh, hurting other life forms as well. Um, I think we're very hypocritical in terms of, say, wildlife, and then still what we do with cattle and do other things as well. And so it's a very difficult thing because we are still homo sapiens. We still evolve. But if and, and, then, and nature is going to still be there. So we obviously don't mm. want to impact nature and world, wildlife. But I think we're going to be at an interesting point later on in our evolution where we need to decide how do, what do we do about food? Um, what do we do about ourselves? Um, and do we want to create other conscious AIs and, and AGIs and super intelligence. I think we're going to get to those things as well. But in my book, I've tried to say, we, we start a conversation with Web3 and AI, and it, all of it plugs into the kind of world that I'm proposing as well, which is I'm very happy about. I think we're going in the right direction, but we need to navigate. We need wisdom to navigate things um, and to make sure that we make smart moves. Um, but I would just like to see that we use this to um, in beneficial ways because it, as I've mentioned in the book, and I've got some slides talking about, we actually on a it was almost like on a runaway car where we lose, we almost are just we don't we don't we, it's difficult to control the steering wheel. Maybe we don't have access to the brakes. It feels like or it's like a runaway train, and we we need to, to be smart about how do we get this thing still on on the track, making sure that mm. we've got the right move. So we've got to be very smart because the problem is we can create uh, lethal autonomous weapons 
that just create havoc at scale. We can create bioweapons, use AI to create mm. uh, things that can just cause massive extinction. Um, and mm. so and how do we prevent the bad actors from not doing the bad things? And that's maybe the danger. Mm. It's, and Spider-Man has got this saying, with great power come great responsibility. And I feel as humanity, we're getting a lot of power here, but we like kids in the candy store. We we need more wisdom. Mm. And I feel even the governments, even the biggest economies in the world, even if you look at the US with all the great stuff that they're doing, they're also struggling to get proper leadership. And there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of governments, but there's a lot of things that's not perfect. So um, we, we need to figure out more things very quickly. <laughs> And, and um, so that, that's why it's a very interesting time. It's an exciting time as well, but because we can see light at the end of the tunnel here. We can see the abundant world that we can create. But then we've got also uh, worse uh, kind of bad outcomes as well. And in Chapter 10 of my book, mm. I talk about kind of the possible outcomes, dystopian outcomes, utopian, protopian. And, and there's a lot of thought leaders uh, a lot of people thinking about this as well. So I've tried to 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 synthesize um, some of the best thoughts on that and try to put it into uh, the book, and then try to also uh, think about how do how does that con uh, contribute to uh, a massive transformative purpose for humanity that will help put us on the right track? And can we can we focus on that? It's almost like when we play golf. If you th think about the dam, you're going to put the ball in the water. But if you think about the fairway, I want to hit the ball here, and you've got your goal set for what you want to achieve here, you've got the right massive transformative purpose, that for me is the right thing that we should do. We should focus on the AF for good, but we've got to make sure that we, we obviously don't go there. Uh, mm. So anyway. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Lots of good yeah. thoughts. Sorry, go <laughs> Yeah, no, lots of uh, good thoughts. Uh, um, and I just love the perspective that um, you are bringing to, co to, to the conversation to say, you know, we've got to be responsible enough so that uh, whatever we're creating doesn't uh, become a runaway thing, that people yeah. can't control it uh, uh, in the end. Uh, um, and we will dive into that conversation. Before we get into the ethics of AI, I would want you to talk about how you think AI is going to disrupt education. I told you that um, oh, yes. I'm a trained teacher, teacher oh, at yes. heart. So it's uh, it's of great interest to me. I want to know what are yes, your views? Okay, okay so, yeah. so you know what? I've got some exciting ideas, even for companies around this as well. Even when I talk to Post Sapiens, I talk about a lifelong learning, life-wide learning, AI assistant that helps you because I think education shouldn't stop just at school or university. It should be ongoing. I'm, I'm a very curious person. I want to learn. I want to understand reality. Truth is an accurate understanding of reality and an essential foundation for producing good outcomes. And it's almost like if you ignore the physical laws and the laws of nature, if you ignore the laws of economics uh, and all of those kind of things, you're going to be, you're going to pay the price for that. And mm. that statement I just said was actually from Ray Dalio, that was the, the, the founder of uh, Bridge, Bridgewater Associates, one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. And they are, will be basically the reason he's saying that because if they're not in touch with reality around their investments um, and what's really happening with the economy, um, they, they will pay a price uh, or their, the people that invest money will, will pay a price. But going back to education, what, what's really important for me is and how it will disrupt things. If Just imagine if you've got an a AI assistant or something that, that's completely personalized, that knows your level of understanding of certain concepts, obviously given that it knows quite a bit. Now you see already with GPT-4 or ChatGPT and now with BAR, uh, just with large language models, even though you don't have systems that truly understand what it, well, they don't, they're just predicting words. They, they, they're mm. not conscious. There's maybe emergent behavior in terms of reasoning and stuff, but um, we, we haven't built systems that, it, that, it, that are like us. But what it, what it did was to train, was train on the knowledge 
of humanity and understanding a few things. But just imagine you've got an AI system even like that, but that understands you, that's more personalized, um, and and can guide you on your own journey in terms of all the things that you are interested in. And for me, if I just think about now, I was always into math. Uh, well, you, you, were, you were also a math teacher, stuff, so math, science, those kind of things, computer science, technology. But I just realized, maybe afterwards, I just realized the importance of philosophy, um, mm -hmm. the importance of biology, those kind of things as well, because obviously I want to understand the brain. But if you think about philosophy, if you think about questions like what is the nature of being, if you think about ontology, think about epistemology, you know, just big words and stuff like that, but it's, it's words that the study of knowledge um, and what is reality. Um, axiology is what is good, what is bad. Now, with religion, we've got morality built in there, but if you look at philosophy more generic, axiology and ethics and all of those kind of things are baked in there already. So those things, for me, we should have been taught about those kind of things at school, critical thinking about those baseline questions as well. So if I've got a, a lifelong, if I've got an assistant that helps me have a, a balanced perspective of the most important things in terms of the most important questions of humanity um, mm. and, and also patient with me as I'm on my journey. And we know that with children, with kids, there's, there's a nature versus nurture. That's kind of the, the nurture period where they need to be slowly taught various things in life. Now, we've got curriculums, but I think the curriculums needs to be redesigned uh, as well. I mean, just imagine the AI system that understands what the meaning of life, character building, all the things that are truly important, and trying to help people to be critical thinkers, to have 21st century skills, and and things that are very important, like adapt, to adapt quickly, or things like cross-cultural understanding, having empathy with people, um, uh, uh, valuing that, then I think we're going to get a uh, civilization, so that's why education is so important. It's going to help civilization to up its wisdom levels, its character levels, all of those kind of things. So for me, education is not just the foundation literacies and stuff. It's, mm. it's, it's really talking about the meaning of life. It's talking about quality of life. And if we can teach our children all of those kind of things, I think that, that's going to be huge. Um, so, I, so the way it's going to disrupt things is... <laughs> it's. I think we still want the human centricness. We you need teachers to to encourage people. If I think about my teachers, that was really good. It was the people that was very passionate about their subjects. It was mm -hmm. people that was. It was almost the way they did it, the way they mm -hmm. operated. It was. So they, it's almost like um, mentors, guy. So I think teachers could be more on that level function and then with the, you've got AI assistance that's helping on a personalized level and then maybe some of that information that you allow the learner allows that the teacher can have the teacher can assist you further it's almost like what we do with Vive Teens and Journey Wellness where you've got the combination of the world-class content uh, AI assistant and then human counselors and you bring it all together in a in a, in a way to to provide the best possible solution and offering to, to the individual. So I would just like to see that. So to go from the factory model to a completely personalized model, and I think that's going to be possible. Um, and where people really understand, and, and this is something else that's also interested, interesting. I, I think mm. with technology, I think people get very dependent on technology as well, but we should always have these AI systems also teach us to, if the electricity is down or the AI system is not there, how do I survive and thrive? Do I still have the skills to do that? So, for instance, with Google Maps, we drive cars. We're so dependent on Google Maps. People don't use maps anymore. Don't think about it. We, we, mm. But it might be good to still have basic skills uh, just in case you, you actually need it. Um, so you're not too dependent. So it's a fine balance between uh, being using technology to help you, but still make sure that you understand things. Uh, and 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 to 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 actually be independent as well. So it's going to be a fine balance. And if you've got systems that truly help you to understand the principles, so Elon Musk talks about 
first principles a lot, reasoning from first principles and so forth, which I, I think is so important. But if you've got AI systems where that help you not just remember things remotely, so you can obviously, we know we need to uh, do space learning. We need to have kind of, we need to remember things as well. So that's going to be important as well. But if we can reason from first principles um, and we get more people that can do that, that's going to be great. That's going to be better. So we can have more thinking people uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what education should be doing. should be focusing on not only knowledge levels, but also skills in terms of thinking skills and, and other things as well. Um, think, think about emotional intelligence, social intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's not just mm -hmm. cognitive things. There's more things there as well. So anyway, so I'm excited, like you, that uh, if yeah. we are smart and wise, we're going to have some fantastic stuff happening in education. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Um, I'm more excited about the role that the teacher is going to take on. Like you say, yes. the teacher is uh, probably going to be more a facilitator of learning, uh, you know, yeah. rather than the initiator. Um, yeah. So yeah think about the be... curriculums, work with the ASS, mm. and think about the analytics produced by, yes. by the system on real-time analytics and focus on, you can even have a very smart child that's on its own path that yeah. needs some guidance in a different kind of guidance. But then you can immediately, mm. because, because it's not, the reason where there will always be kind of a role is that there will always be mentorship and assistance needed at various places because everybody Absolutely. starts almost like a blanket slate. If you think about a small mm. child, and they yeah. need to learn the ups and downs of life and mm. not everything is the same and things are changing all the time as well so yeah we, we mm. are I, I love this david deutsch he's got two books that i highly recommend mm. he's a physicist he's like the father of quantum computing as well but he um the first one is the fabric of reality and the second mm. one is the beginning of infinity and so mm. he's talking about theory scientific theories it's not about the opposite, but it's not about just the predictions that it makes and, and so forth. It's actually about the explanatory power um, that these explanations, and everything that we've got is actually explanations. Explanations for mm. the economy, for our family works, our government's work, explanation. You get so, but he talks about the four kind of strands of knowledge that really was key to where we are now. And the first one is it's obviously around quantum mechanics and, and basically everything around physics, um, providing a basis for reality, helping us with um, understanding technology and so forth. But then the other one is around epistemology, around the study of knowledge. Uh, Karl Popper that talks about the scientific method. Um, how do we gain more knowledge, um, explanations and all of those things. And he's kind of against induction, more against deduction. The reason why he's against induction, well, you, you're a math, you've got a math background, is because you know about this kind of black swan kind of thing? You think, you say, one, n is equal to one, proof. n is equal to two, and then n is equal to n plus one. And you kind of prove, prove, prove. Mm. But there will always be situations where you get to, we see a black swan where, oh, this, this thing doesn't fit. Um, Absolutely. So you got to be careful with induction. But anyway, so that's one piece. Then the other two has to do with Darwin's evolution, the, the fact that how systems evolved. And then the last one is about the theory of computation, what we see now, obviously, with computers and computation in general. So between those four things, you can describe a lot of things from first principles around civilization and so forth. So that should be part of the curriculum mm. anyway. So, um, but, but, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, do, do you want to know anything more about that before I dig into more details there? I just want to make sure, sure I stay on track because there's many, many... Yeah, yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think, I, th I think you've brought a lot of value and uh, just uh, um, uh, knowledge that will help people to understand how AI um, is actually going to disrupt uh, education. And these are conversations that I think uh, people need to be engaging in, uh, especially from uh, the educator's uh, perspective. Um, but as we converse, I want us to talk about the ethics. Um, yes. Because Not that's uh, that. that's actually the biggie. Yeah, that's the biggie. <laughs> as uh, we are excited about, uh, you know, the possibilities that uh, artificial intelligence 
brings. We know that the challenges of uh, how we navigate the area of ethics uh, remains uh, quite problematic there. What are the, what are the most significant uh, ethical considerations uh, in your view um, when it comes to developing AI technology and how can developers address them to ensure yeah, responsible AI usage? Fantastic question. Um, yeah, so do you know what? Even if I think about when I talk about ethics and if you, if you think about trustworthy AI, trustworthy AI's definition is ethical AI plus robust AI plus lawful AI. So you, you need to, that's maybe kind of the banner. So no one can dig into what's ethical AI, robust, lawful AI. Another quick perspective, in terms of providing AI solutions for multiple decades now that I've been involved in, especially in the industrial world, it was very important to have robust, safe systems. So those, so as part of trustworthy AI, robust and safe systems, very important. But now as we've instrumented the world with the internet and with smartphones, we've actually instrumented people and we've generated a lot of data around people and businesses and the internet. And it was like exponential. It's probably even more than the industrial, uh, although both will just contribute to more. Now, now we need to say, okay, we've got AI systems that's doing recommendations to people or are doing, um, mm -hmm. say, for instance, if you think about um, a bank, a need to make decisions around loans. There's the classification and there's the question now, is there bias in there? Are they ethical in their solutions um, as well? So, so we, what we've done over the last two decades is now to build, to use AI more for consumer facing businesses. For, so mm -hmm. when it's industrial, safety, robust, very important. When it's consumer, ethical, lawful stuff, very important. Also safe and robust. Also robust systems are also very important. So, so what happened now, which, which, and I think we're making as humanity quite a bit of progress on this. I think especially in the European Union, they came out with this trustworthy AI framework where they talk about ethical, robust, lawful AI and talked about the principles around ethical AI. And the, there's four principles around ethical AI. So the first autonomy or human autonomy. And I think that probably ties a little bit into the rights of the individual, and, or just humans. You don't want systems to, to control um, humans like Big Brother in all respects. Mm. So, that, that is, so autonomy, I think, is important. Um, the other one is no harm. We don't, uh, they talk about maleficence, benefic benefic beneficence, uh, but no harm is, is very important. And then the other one is fairness. You want the system to be fair. As humans, we want to be fair. So we think about ethical systems, we want to be fair. And then the other thing is explicability. You want to make sure that you can explain. So we, we, we want people to say the reason why you didn't get this loan was this, is this, is this, whatever it is, mm. or you didn't qualify, whatever it is, but there needs to be fairness as well. Or, uh, so, so those four things are very, very important. And, the, and then you can think about the seven requirements around um, uh, trustworthy AI. And the first one is, and it ties a little bit into the, the principles as well, is human agency and oversight. So whenever AI systems are developed, you want to make sure that there's humans are in the loop, even if it's uh, just on an objective function um, or, the, or the, the reasons of what it's doing to calibrate that, what, what you do, or just checking that it's actually producing proper things, to testing, validating it. So, so the human agency and oversight thing is very, very important. Because especially in the world where we're moving from assisted, augmented, autonomous intelligence, you're going to have systems that are just operating on its own, like humans. We humans are like AGIs, uh, artificial mm. general intelligences that's operating on their own, but we're within the, the construct of civilization and lawful and abiding by the structures of, of governance of, of, of countries and so forth. But anyway, so human agency and oversight, very important. Second thing is technical robustness and safety. So obviously for industrial space, but also we want that in the consumer facing space. The third thing is privacy and data governance. Um, and this is where it's kind of maybe you've got, uh, you've got a surveillance state. I'm very worried about digital dictatorship. 
That's why I'm worried about China as well, where if they've got complete control, a government, a government of their citizens, and it's going to be very difficult to actually change governments and to if you don't respect the individuals. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. Unfortunately, in the West, and just in general, in in democratic countries, we, we value privacy and data governance. And I think South Africa, we've got the Papia Act or uh, the Poppy Act, uh, mm. and we've got GDPR. Uh, and I think those are wholesome things. They're, they're all good, uh, and it's going to be important. So privacy and data governance is important. So we want our AI system to respect that. Fourth is transparency. So we want people, we want, I think we want transparency. That That is just an important uh, thing to have. The fifth thing is diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness. We want we, we want this. So we, we, in South Africa, we've got a history. Okay, I was too young for the apartheid uh, kind of era, but, but in the new phase, we, for me, I, I value, I think it's a good thing of humanity to value diversity and non-discrimination um, and, mm -hmm. and to be fair as, 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 as possible with everyone. This, the sixth one is, is, um, is, sorry, I've got a call coming in. I'm just going to close it. Sure, no problem. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> it's actually a guy, another guy that I want to talk to that's important in terms of of the uh, in terms of what we do want to do in Africa as well, um, mm. uh, yeah. You, but anyway, so the sixth thing is about societal environmental well-being. So we want to make sure the society and environment is 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 being looked after. So when we implement IA solutions, then the seventh one is accountability. If you implement solutions, mm. you want to make sure you're accountable for that. So mm. those are the seven principles. And I think we, we're not missing big ones there if we cover that. So if we do that, we can implement trustworthy AI systems. And I think it doesn't matter what kind of AI solution you implement, that's going to be important to do. Mm, mm. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. In your book, Democratizing Artificial Intelligence to Benefit Everyone, you discuss making AI accessible to all. Can you just elaborate on the importance of this mission and the potential consequences if we fail to do so? There's a whole talk of uh, let no one be left behind. And yes. I just love how you are so given to this mission um, yeah. of making sure everybody's included. Yeah, I love that. I think that's such a good question, another one. I This is by, by the way, you can see democratizing AI to benefit everyone. Um, and, and it's it's really, I, I'm just concerned, even with the tech giants, with all the good stuff that Google is doing and Facebook, because social media is a social experiment um, with humanity, which is not all good. But there are some good things, mm. but this, it's not all good. That's why we need to think about more. We need to kind of engineer the internet and with the right protocols so that we can create more this kind of decentralized world, create an economy, where we, we make more the, the advantages, the power of this technology available to more people. Now, I actually in the book talked about the MTP for humanity and I talk about more decentralized world and I talk about, I'm very happy about blockchain and all these kind of technologies because I think we've got the toolbox, the tools, the Lego blocks to help create that world that's possible. So I can see that's possible. Um, but what I also uh, suggested in the book is Sapiens, which is an AI-driven user control super platform where that actually where there's an AI assistant that empowers the individual where the individual's data is, uh, is in fact protected it's almost like a data vault but then where this AI assistant is kind of helping you to monetize your data and services so it's not only about using the technology because in a certain sense the tech giants are democratizing AI and the fact that they make chat GPT or open AI make this available or search is so much easier but they still do okay that's great check but they still monetize mm -hmm. it's still advertising revenue that's driving google and facebook and so forth now so you want to balance you want to obviously incentivize those tech giants to also make money but it shouldn't be to the detriment of the individual so if there's ways where we can re-architect the internet web3 and AI and so forth where we are making sure that people are, that it almost helps people to actually monetize their data and services, package their services, their skills, 
their positive contributions to humanity in such a way that they are being rewarded and that they also get the benefits of this abundance. And, and the mm. money is not only getting going to the tech giants, everything. So it's about creating a more equitable world, but you still want kind of kind of capitalism where you want to incentivize people that's very creative, coming with great solutions. Reward them. You've got to reward them. Well, you 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 also function in this more capitalistic kind of world. You understand the benefits of that. And you want to the world is not going to be when we say equitable, we don't mean necessarily equal. It's because people will have different interests, different drives, all of those kind of things, but you want to give opportunities to as many people as possible. And then they want to optimize quality of life um, in that space. And and you don't need to have lots of money or anything. People can be very happy by just exercising their freedom in doing what they can do and still being um, healthy, still have a great uh, quality of life, all of those kind of things, and contributing in their own way. And that's why it's so great that people are not the same because they can contribute in different ways. Um, so if we can create the, that kind of world, I think that's going to be huge. So what, that's what I'm trying to propose. Well, that's what I propose in the book, with Sapiens specifically. I'm also mm. excited about other initiatives that's happening that could provide the basis for this kind of world. And there's one company that I'm interacting with in Los Angeles, in California, called Versus. Um, and they are also envision, in, well, envisioning uh, a world where it's, it's completely decentralized and... Where, where people are empowered with their own AI assistance in the same kind of way, way but uh, also a world where you, that's, they talk about the spatial web. So it's completely <clears throat> redefined where everything in the web, everything is instrumented. We know we're creating an internet of things, an internet of, uh, of uh, they talk about IoT or the internet of everything. <laughs> um, mm. The more you instrument cars, houses, all sorts of different things, the more knowledge is available there. And if you've got every piece of entity that sits there, every node with its own knowledge defined in the spatial web, um, then you can have its own AI agent. So you will have, actually have in, uh, a kind of intelligent agents that, that will collaborate with one another in creating an abundant world and operating with your AI assistant and trying to optimize your world. So you can actually have um, AI agents in your house that's optimizing your house and optimizing the world for you. Um, mm. and if, if you're going to get self-driving cars that really understands its own health in terms of what it's doing. Maybe it can also be like an Uber car for other things. It can do things as well. So there's many, many possibilities and opportunities as well. So, so I, I, I just see opportunities to create a, a, a better world uh, in a more decentralized way where we can have more people have access to more things. And, and for me in Africa, it starts with basic things. We mm. want everyone to have digital access to the, well, access to the internet in, in a cost-effective way. So currently, we do have the mobile network operators that are making money, data, yeah. and data is coming. How can we democratize that? So we, we need to probably think about, is that a bottleneck? Mm. Is that causing friction? Um, then think about, once we've got internet access, then what are the wholesome layers that we put on top of this? So that people are, are actually, so this is where education comes in, hugely. Um, I think that's why if we've got digital access to the internet and we've got the right kind of wholesome education that people can be critical thinkers, but also be respectful, empathy, have all of those kind of things. I think we're going to create that better world. Um, and then uh, there will be more opportunities for people to, to operate. So if we can put the guardrails in place for people to just flourish, doesn't matter where they come from. I think mm -hmm. that will be all. Awesome. Um, and then I think people, we shouldn't have poverty, we shouldn't have people that are, don't have food, because there's enough food in the, in the world. We need to distribute it in a better way. We need to organize the world. We shouldn't have people that suck out the wealth. That's what happened here in South Africa with a lot of corruption and things happening, a lot of bad actors. If we can just get to a world where we, 
we would get maybe this is where I, I would love to see more direct democracy, more decentralized kind of world. We still need people and governance. We need, I think it's a good thing to have leaders and so forth, but it should be more decentralized and the law should be mm -hmm. more kind of dynamic. I think Elon Musk talks about when he talks about governance on Mars, if there's going to be something like that, um, that there's yeah. more sunset clauses. And things that doesn't work. See, this law, you see, you've got to be almost like I have a dynamic kind of law. Now, if you've got implement this kind of things, uh, this in smart contracts, where you've got, you can see over this thing, you can do analytics on laws and things that's not working. You can quickly phase it out. You bring in new things. Mm. You are very adaptable. Um, and yeah. you try to optimize for quality of life in a local way. And, and I think if people have more influence where they live, and then less influence the further you go, that's that's okay. Mm. And you can have mm. systems that support that. That's that's why mm. I'm thinking there could be governance systems, AI-driven governance systems, decentralized governance systems that, that support us on all levels of society, from the family, local community, smart towns, smart cities, going broader to, to states, and, and etc. But uh, I would just love to see a world where we say Cape Town work directly with Joburg and you've got the cities and small towns interacting directly with too much, mm. too, no, not much hindrance and and where you uplift certain towns that need more or communities that need more uh, because that, that, that need more kind of wealth or support um, because if you think about the body if you've got say something my my arm is damaged or whatever uh, that's part of my body and we don't want we want to be healthy as a complete human being. So as mm. a complete civilization, we want to be healthy. We, we don't want nodes in the network to be unhealthy. So we want to support that. So I would love to see a world where we, we do that. And that's what I'm talking about in the book as well. I love it. 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 Uh, so just uh, um, inclusive thinking uh, in whatever we're doing, yes. Um, yes. you know, um, yeah, no, you've brought such great value, and uh, we actually need another podcast, uh, yeah. you know, to just dive I know it's into the hour. concept. <laughs> yeah. I cannot yeah. believe it that uh, we've already hit uh, uh, an hour. So, yeah. as we start um, closing this conversation, yes, let's look at uh, some of the examples of some AI projects or solutions yes. that are already making positive impact on people's lives um that are, are really geared towards uh, focusing on human centric uh, outcomes yeah so for me the i think these the best examples are in healthcare wellness education i i think there's there are things around climate change and all sorts of different things but the ones that's close to me because where i'm involved in i've mentioned that i think offline i mentioned this to you when i talked about i think i mentioned it online as well the in terms of Vive Teen Wellness, this kind of AI-driven, human-centric uh, wellness companion for teenagers. And we know that, uh, yeah, this is the other thing. We, as, <laughs> we have the bad, the bad thing, this is like a big social experiment. The internet and social media was a big mm. experiment with civilization. And we keep mm. on doing these experiments. Um, and even with COVID, the way we handled it was kind of a big experiment as well at scale. Not yeah. always optimal. <laughs> The way we've we've closed down, we we, we overreacted. We and, and mm. under, we did so many things not right. Um, but anyway, so we we are, so 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 how do we? But now back to the mental health of teenagers. We saw that this this the, the, if you think about suicides and uh, the trouble that you that that our teenagers our children have right now because of this. Not only children, I think everyone, a lot of people in general, and it is maybe caused by over flood of information, this kind of attention-driven economy, this kind of thing that you've built a thing with Instagram and TikTok and the likes and all of those kind of things, which is unhealthy. I see it with my own children as well. Um, mm. I, and I, I feel it's bad. So how do we create more an intention versus attention-driven uh, kind of economy mm. where mm. it's we've got more character wisdom built into, baked into it. So, And that's why V-Team Wellness is at least an attempt to bring in human counselors, making it human centric, with world class content, with the uh, AI system, and providing a wholesome solution with wholesome content 
to you. So for me, that's a great example. And the same with Journey Wellness that looks at diet, nutrition, exercise, along with mental wellness and so forth. Um, so, and I think there are plenty of these kind of solutions now out there that even looks at, like say, calm or meditation or those kind of things, just helping people to, to, to really function in this world. And it's almost like now kind of using human-centric AI tech to help solve some of the problems that tech also created uh, as well. So it's, 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 uh, so we need to be smart how we engineer things. Uh, uh, but, but anyway, so I would, I would probably conclude with those two examples, um, which, which for me is perfect examples of AI driven and uh, human centricness and bringing kind of the human also into the platform. Uh, we've got counselors also providing services. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, well, this has been a very, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been a very informative uh, um, and educational conversation. Uh, lots to process. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I also just love the way you bring the practicality side of things. Uh, yeah. Because uh, when people hear AI, they're thinking abstract. Um, yeah. You know, so I love, I love the fact that you've brought it home, you know, uh, yeah. it's uh, in an everyday conversation and uh, you've brought a lot of value to the listeners. So thank you so much. Fantastic, Sarah. I'm looking forward to the podcast and maybe share it as well. And uh, it was, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, and it's the first time I've met you. So it just great. It was a great conversation, excellent questions and awesome speaking with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yes, definitely, we need to plan for the second one. Um, yeah. So yeah, we can, uh, we can hear as much uh, from you and uh, your thought leadership uh, on this uh, important topic. Fantastic. Thank you very much. If people want to access the book, it's on jockludic.com. It's also, uh, there's a PDF that's for free, but it's on Amazon. There's the audio versions, but there's also on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, um, uh, where I've got the audio of the book as well. So, but anyway, and it's on Audible as well. But uh, all good. Thank you. Yes, thank you, no, Sarah. Thank you. Absolutely. Pleasure. And thank you, thank you so much for actually bringing that. I was actually going to ask you, I totally forgot <laughs> where people can yeah. access. Because, uh, uh, yeah, people are looking for content and material that they yeah. can read. Uh, um, yeah. Definitely, I, I'll be committing to, to reading your book. On audio, I do very well with audio. I'm always reading. Yeah, me too. So, yeah. I listen to books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm jogging. Well, I'm hiking. <laughs> yes, exactly. I do it when I'm cooking. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> As I cook in the kitchen, yeah, I've got my ear put on <laughs> and good. I'm listening to, to the book. So, yeah, that works very well for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fantastic, Sarah. It was awesome talking to you. And uh, thank you very much once again. Yeah, I know it's been an 